Hebrews chapter 5 in just a moment. It seems like I've kind of been kind of uh, exploring a little bit in Hebrews lately. make a statement. We must grow in Christ. We must move forward from where we entered into the Christian life or else we will become stuck and never able to move forward at all. And sometimes there's opposition that comes. Listen to this. Sometimes we get saved and we're excited about it, but opposition comes, maybe from family, maybe from friends, from maybe because of some conflict between Christianity and your work. But because opposition comes, we, we say, well, I don't think I can deal with this. I'm just going to back off, be quiet, mind my own business, and not push my Christianity any further than where it is right now. You're up the mountain moving towards maturity in Christ. But when you stop on a steep slope, you don't just stay put, you actually begin to slide backwards. These believers that we're going to read about in our passage tonight were in such a situation. They were stuck. You ever feel like you're stuck in your Christianity? You're just stuck? I mean, you're, you either feel like I'm here where I used to be, but I can't get any further. Or maybe you say, I was stuck, and now I'm regressing, going backwards. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever been that way? That's what we find in this passage of Scripture. And I hope this is a help. I want to be an encouragement. A preacher's job is to encourage, inform, instruct, to make people learn more about what God wants from them so that you reap the benefits of joy, peace, and contentment. This is not just all for God's benefit. It helps you too. Let's read about maturing in Christ in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse number 11. The writer of Hebrews says, Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you're dull of hearing. For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Harrison, my grandson's moving forward from milk right now. He's been eating green peas and green beans and carrots and squash. Uh, Erica pulverizes them up, and is it in a Vitamix that you do that? And and that little guy, he goes after it, man. He, I mean, he's serious. You can tell when he, when he goes for that spoon, when he gets that spoon that close, he's after it. <laughs> he's moving away from milk into stronger foods. And eventually, I'll take him over to pie, burgers, fries, and pies and get him a brisket burger. Verse 13, and every, for, every one of, for everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now let's go into chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, anytime you see a therefore, you look back and see what it's there for. And it's there for what we just read in the previous verses, and now he's going to describe this situation of maturity further. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on. I'd advise you to underline those two words in your Bible. Go on. Don't stop. Go on. Don't be satisfied with who you are. Let us go on unto perfection. Now, none of us are perfect in this life. We will be moving towards perfection as we mature in Christ. 
And that's the sense of this word perfection is moving towards more completion, maturity. And he says, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of, of the doctrine of baptisms and laying on of hands and resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this will, we will do, if God permit, for it is impossible. Here's the passage of scripture that is so much debated in Christian circles, theologians, Bible teachers, preachers. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them, who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Father, we pray that you'd bless us in this preaching time. Lord, help us to focus on the Word of God, the Son of God, through the Spirit of God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What happens when you get stuck? Imagine a man in the jungle. He's making his way through the thick growth of the jungle and he steps, you've seen this in the movies, he steps into quicksand and he begins to go down. He tries to pull his feet out, but they're stuck. He tries to pull the other one out, but you know what happens every time he tries to pull his foot out, he sinks a little deeper. And he's stuck there in the quicksand without being able to free himself. Along comes a guy and sees he's stuck, and he offers to cut down a bamboo pole and hold it out so he can stand away from the edge of the quicksand and stick the pole out and pull him from his stuck position out of the sand. But the fellow that's stuck in the sand says, no, no, don't pull me out. There's actually a, a solid rock down there. I don't think I'm going to sink any foot further. So just leave me alone because I've got these people that stop by and they'll bring me food once in a while and they'll even sing to me. And so I'm okay just staying here. Go on. Does that make sense? <laughs> I don't think any of you would do that, would you? What happens when you get stuck and you can't move? Well, Lot's wife got stuck and turned back and looked at the city and she never moved again. Well, when people get stuck, they're like these Hebrews were. These early Christians, they were Jews. They had trusted Christ as Savior. They're born again and they've heard some preaching. They've heard some teaching. They've been involved in fellowship with other Christians and they're, they're somewhat knowledgeable about what happened. They knew enough to get saved. But then something happened. Opposition came. Well, see, what happened was that the, uh, the family of Jews that was around them, their family and friends that were involved in the temple worship, the Old Testament law, they... The, those Pharisees and the families of these Hebrew Christians, they're happy in that temple worship. They're going in and they're making all their sacrifices and they're trying to follow the law and that's their religion. They've been doing that a long time and they're just happy with it and they're kind of like the man stuck in the quicksand. Don't bother us, we're okay. And these Hebrew Christians get stuck even though they believed on Christ, got involved in some church, learned a little bit about the Bible, but then their progress stopped and they got stuck. I think 
things like this happen to us. Now in Hebrews chapter 6, it says there that it's impossible for these people, if they go to a certain point, it's impossible for them to repent and get back to the place where they were. And they run the risk of getting stuck in that immaturity and not able to move forward ever again. And they must go on, according to the writer of Hebrews, in order to keep from getting stuck. Remember I had you underline those two words? Go on. He's saying, go on. Don't stop. Don't stop. Yeah, there's some opposition coming. Yeah, they're treating you bad. They're persecuting you. Your family acts like they don't know you anymore. Your employer won't let you come back to your job because you professed faith in this Jesus Christ fellow who's tearing down our temple worship, religion. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, look, I understand that it's not easy. You are having some opposition. And yes, it does hurt. But you can't stop. It's, it's like being out in the middle of a thunderstorm. You know, I got caught out a few days ago, and I got caught out in the middle of a thunderstorm. And I was halfway between my old chicken house shed and my house, and I'm halfway between, and I thought, maybe I ought to run back. I'm standing there getting drenched. No, I need to go forward. Which way's closer? <laughs> and you know what happens? You just keep getting drenched. You can't stop. You can't give up. You can't go back. You've got to go on. And so I, I moved forward as fast as I could, got in the house. These Jews were attempting to be Christians and go back to the old way of temple worship because the pressure was on. Some of you know what pressure is on you. Because if you, try to get, if you try to get too Christianized, there's going to be people, people call you radical, <laughs> fanatic, involved in a cult. <laughs> yeah. You know, because usually that's a defense mechanism by them because you're, you're a little more advanced maybe than they are. You're trying to do more things for the Lord than they are, and so they have to justify their reason for being stuck where they are so they criticize you, right. and they, dra they drag you down. Well, this is the thrust of the entire book of Hebrews. As you read through all 13 chapters, you're going to find this is the underlying thought. There were some believers who truly trusted Christ, but they got stuck and the writer, who I believe was Paul, I don't know, can't prove it, but I believe it's Paul, and he's saying to them, uh, look, you can't just stay stuck. You've got to get moving on. And he's giving them several arguments, incentives, and encouragements to get them to move forward in the Christian faith so they're not stuck without hope of ever moving forward again. Einstein said, you don't really understand the subject unless you can explain it in a simple way. And that's basically the simple way to explain Hebrews. Some Old Testament Jews got saved and now they're being tempted to be drawn back into that ceremonial temple worship so they can take the pressure off. You ever feel like, maybe if I just backed off of my faith a little bit, maybe people leave me alone and not think I'm weird. Well, some of you are weird enough it won't matter one way or the other. You might as well go on. <laughs> if anybody asks you if Hebrews is difficult to understand just tell them what Einstein said if you can state it in a simple way I think it's uh, in philosophy they call it Occam's razor <laughs> the less complicated your proposition is the more likely it is to be so to be true if you have to come up with Paragraph upon paragraph to explain the bottom line, it might be, might be that you're trying to invent something that ain't really there. A Christian of that time would not progress in maturity if they gave in to the eased, packaged religion of their day, which was Judaism. They weren't going to move forward as long as they're clinging to that temple worship. You don't want to get stuck. 
I, I used to build houses back when I was a, a real young fellow, and, and we're down on the subfloor. We're, we've nailed down the floor joists, put the plywood on the floor, and we'd tack the plywood down at the corners and maybe one or two nails in the middle. And this is back before nail guns were very prevalent. We did it all by hand, I mean, swinging a hammer. And so we're tacking all that plywood down on the whole subfloor, maybe as big as this auditorium, and then we'd go back and, and we'd all spread out and just start nailing every six inches or so along the uh, floor joists. Well, I'm just nailing away. Man, I'm having a good time. I'm nailing away, and then I try to move. Man, I can't move. I'm stuck. What is wrong? And I look, and Mutt Phipps, who was nailing behind me, had nailed the sole of my shoe to the floor. <laughs> I'm trying to move. <laughs> I'm stuck. You know, as long as you're stuck, <laughs> you can't move. And that's what happened to these Hebrew Christians. The predic predicament of these people has much to say to Christians today who have become stuck in their Christianity. They learned some things, but they haven't moved forward. They learned just enough to say, well, I'm satisfied with what, what I know. I know that salvation is by the blood of Christ. I know that, yeah, I ought to go to church once in a while, and I know I ought to pray once in a while, and I know I ought to read my Bible every once in a while, and that's all I need to know. And they're happy with the salvation message every Sunday morning. But let me tell you something. If you're not hearing something new, you're not growing. Now, I'm not talking about making stuff up that ain't so. It better come out of here. But you don't know everything that's in here, and neither do I. And so if I'm going to grow, I need to learn more about what's in here. And as a pastor, I need to dish out a meal of what I've learned that was helpful to me, and maybe it will be to you. If you only hear what you already know, you never grow. It was obnoxious to this writer of Hebrews that these Christians weren't growing anymore in their faith, that they had halted along the way. 2 Peter 3.18 says, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're supposed to keep on learning because if we don't learn, we don't grow. And when, what we learn, listen, what we learn, we have to put it into practice or we haven't learned it. Just because you know it up here, it didn't make it to here necessarily. And so we have to get it from here to here and then from here into practice. And as we practice what we've learned, we grow. It's that way with the muscles of our bodies. I guess the old saying is right. Use it or lose it. 2 Peter 1.5 says, And beside all this, giving all diligence... Add to your faith virtue. Did you notice that word add? Peter's writing to Christians. He said, now you've got faith, but you need to add. There's some things you need to add to it. He said, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience and to patience godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness. Well, let's stop right there just a minute. Rabbit just jumped up. Brotherly kindness. You know what I'm seeing a lot of nowadays is sarcastic Christians who have nothing but criticism for other Christians, even their families. Do you know wives and husbands? You ought to practice brotherly kindness in your family. If you're always putting down your spouse, you're putting down your kids, you're not going to grow. You haven't grown and you're not growing and they're not either. Because you're stunting their growth. Well, got that rabbit. Blew his guts out. Let's read on. And to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. Oh, that too. Charity? <coughs> Actually caring about people, loving people, offering to be helpful and beneficial to others. Instead, of, Hey, listen, most Christians need to learn to get outside themselves and to be helpful to other people. Well, the, def the, the amens are deafening in here. If it wasn't Brother Paul, I'd feel awfully lonesome. <laughs> he says, For these thing if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see you far off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. These Hebrew believers had come to the place 
where they, they forgot what Jesus had done for them. They're saying, man, the pressure's on from my family and from my friends. And, and man, we've got to... We got to quit meeting with this, these people in the church that's worshiping the Lord Jesus, and we got to get back over here to the temple worship and go through those ceremonies because the pressure is just too great. And they'd forgotten what Jesus did for them. Sometimes Christians forget that Jesus has done an awfully lot to save you from your sins. He went to the cross and suffered and bled and died, and then sometimes we just say, "Well, I've learned all about him. I need to know. <laughs> Not moving on any further." No. We ought to keep moving. Keep moving. Exercise. Exercise what you know. Put it to work in your Christian life. Well, these Hebrews were that way spiritually. They were fading fast. And the writer of Hebrews said, man, I've got to rescue these people. They're going downhill and they're in that quicksand and that's not really a rock under them. They're going to sink. We need to expel some faulty notions about this passage while we're here. <clears throat> many religionists of today, listen closely, many religionists of today have made this passage, especially in chapter 6, verse 4, where it says, For it is impossible for those who, have once, those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of of the world come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance. There are those religions who say right there, see, that's just how you lose your salvation. <laughs> that's not what that verse, passage, or the book is talking about at all. Jesus says, He that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. No wise cast out. When you're saved, you're safe. Jesus is not an Indian giver. And then there's others that teach, well, these are people that just got to the edge of salvation. They tasted of these things. They went along with what the Holy Spirit was doing. They were almost saved, but then they pulled back and didn't really get saved. No, the description there is too, it is too clear that these people were saved. These people are Christians. And, and the writer of Hebrews says these are things that accompany salvation. And so it's not losing salvation. It's not advancing to the threshold of salvation. Uh, I like Schofield's old Bible, but he was wrong about that. We'll see just what it is in a little bit. We're on, we're on that trail right now. You see, what was about to happen... The Christian leaders, the preachers, the Christian preachers were trying to warn these people, boy, you don't want to go back to the temple now. Look, you've been saved. Go on and God will give you peace. He will rescue you from what... He's already rescued you from hell and now he's going to... If you'll keep going on this way, he can re rescue you from what's about to happen. Because in A.D. 70... The Romans came in and destroyed Jerusalem, tore down the temple. And it's obviously not happened yet. There's nothing mentioned here to indicate that the temple was already destroyed. So it's about to happen. And the preachers are saying, look, guys, you don't want to go back to that temple now. You're already saved. You need to be going to church. And instead of going back to Judaism, you go back to that temple. And, and what the Romans are going to do is they're going to come in and extinguish this whole city. And along with it, the people who worship at that temple. And so he's intimating to them, if they will follow Christ, these Pharisees, temple worshipers, they are going to pull away from the Christians or rather push the Christians away from them. And so by being disowned from those temple worshipers, they're actually going to be safer than they would be going back to the temple. Because the Romans are about to smash that thing. And anybody that gets in their way. And they did, A.D. 70. You see, when you go back, things can get worse. The national debacle... And danger. Acts 2.38, 
when Peter was preaching at the day of Pentecost, he said, repent and be baptized every one of you for the remission of your sins. He's trying to get them to be baptized, not for salvation. You don't get baptized to be saved. You get saved through faith. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. But Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost, they know that destruction is coming. And he says, if you get baptized, see, baptism set those people apart from the, from the Pharisees and the temple worshipers. Boy, when you got baptized, you were anathema. <laughs> they pushed you away because baptism was a symbol that you were no longer a Jew and you were to be hated because you followed Christ. And that's all the historical context of what's going on here. Hebrews 5, 12 and 13 says, For the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And you become a need of milk. Milk. What is happening in our churches a lot today is that preachers get more accolades if they preach milk. If they preach milk, I mean, if they preach things you already know and you feel comfortable with, man, you just settle in there and give your tithes and offerings and the preacher's happy, you got the attendance up and people stay put. But if you preach things that are strong meat, Sometimes people say, man, I'm out of here. That's new and unusual. Never heard that before. Well, yeah, I saw it in the Bible, but I don't think that's what it means. <laughs> and they're gone. You know, it's, it's, it's harder to build a church preaching the raw truth than it is to preach the milk. Because he says, you're not able to bear it. Baby Christians can take the milk, but they can't take the steak. And that's why so many... Good, small country churches all across our nation. Uh, preachers are preaching the truth, but people don't stay stu stuck in the church. They get stuck in their Christianity instead. And by pursuing the milk, they never grow any further, and they're stuck. And he, this writer, warned them, don't get stuck. There's three, three factors that I believe stick out in this passage of Scripture. Number one, that cause these people to get stuck and stay stuck. And it just might apply to you and me. Number one, the satisfaction factor. The satisfaction factor in verse 11. Chapter 5, verse 11. They had become satisfied with their basic kindergarten Christianity. Hello? They were satisfied with basic kindergarten Christianity. They knew some basics, and they didn't want to move beyond that. I said, man, studying is too hard. <laughs> studying is just too hard. Well, it's work. Study is to show thyself approved unto God. A workman, that needeth not to be ashamed. A workman. You know, to study, it takes work. I mean, it's not easy getting in there and digging things out. And when you find something, you say, man... I don't understand that. Well, to follow up the cross-references, to study this thing, it takes work. Amen. Most people say, man, I don't want that. I'm like Maynard G. Krebs. Work! don't want that. <laughs> and so they're stuck because they're satisfied. We ought not ever be satisfied with the level of maturity we've got. Now, I'm not saying don't be satisfied with your station in life because Paul says, be content with such things as you have. But that doesn't mean stay stuck. And that means be satisfied with what you've got until something better comes along. <laughs> don't give your whole life to pursuing money. Love of money is the root of all evil. Nothing wrong with money as long as it's used rightfully. The satisfaction factor. Verse number 11 of chapter 5. He says of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. Dull. <laughs> dull. And then he says, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk 
and not of strong meat. He said, you're dull and hard of hearing. Dull, your senses are dull. He said that to these Hebrews Christians. He said, now if you learned everything you needed to learn, you wouldn't be pulled back into that temple worship. You'd be moving forward for the Lord. Dull of hearing. I heard about the man that <clears throat> went to have his hearing checked and the doctor removed the man's hearing aid and the patient's hearing improved. For two years he'd been wearing the hearing aid on the wrong ear. He was dull of hearing. You know what I believe? Listen, I believe that there are so many churches where people sit and they listen to the sermon and maybe nod their head and say amen once in a while and it never soaks in. If, if a preacher could preach the same sermon every month, 12 months out of, out of the year, preach it over 12 times, I think in many churches nobody would ever detect it. There's one famous old-time preacher. He preached on a certain subject one Sunday. He preached on it the next Sunday. And for three Sundays, he preached the same thing again. And one of the guys came up to him after church was over, and he said, Preacher, you've preached that three times. He said, when are you going to get another sermon? He said, when you guys start doing what I preached the first time. <laughs> I really, really seriously, I do wonder if the majority of Christians really come to hear a sermon for the purpose of letting it change their lives because it is the quick and powerful Word of God, or if they're coming out of a sense of duty or obligation or to be a good example, those things are all good things, but they're not the primary reason. Well, hear the Word of God because we love the Lord and want Him to change us through His Word. These Hebrews have been spiritually hard of hearing. The, the satisfaction factor. They were satisfied, so they didn't feel like the need to move any further. Uh, they only desire the basic type preaching. They don't want to get anything too involved, you know. I mean, like heaven on Sunday morning. They preached on heaven the last three Sundays. <laughs> yeah, and I hadn't scratched the surface of it. I don't think I'll preach on it this coming Sunday, but I could and not cover the same ground again. They were satisfied because of the time involved in learning. He said, for the time, you, you ought to be teachers. But he said, you have need of one teacher again. See, there was time involved there. And what had happened, they had spent enough time. Do you know that if you spend enough time doing the same old thing or doing nothing, you kind of get stuck in that rut? You know that? They'd been, they'd been used to not doing anything with what they heard for so long. That's part of their problem. You know, if, if we hear that God wants us to do something or to not do something, to stay away from some sin or to start doing some Christian service, if we ignore it long enough, we'll be satisfied. Well, I think the Lord has hushed about that. He'll quit talking to you about it. And that's dangerous. When the Holy Spirit of God quits talking to us about things, that gets dangerous. That's what's happening here. So the, the type of teaching they were satisfied with, the time involved in putting off what they had heard, and Ephesians, see, if you don't adopt what you hear from the Word of God into your life, you'll get to where you'll swallow anything that's, that you hear. There's Christians that, <laughs> that believe all sorts of weird stuff that ain't real. It's because they hadn't listened to the truth enough to be able to weed out the bad doctrine. Ephesians 4.14 says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. You see, the reason cults do carry away many Baptists, I know a Baptist preacher. He was preaching in my community when I was, uh, I was still a lost man working in construction. I know a Baptist preacher. He, he began to pull back. He uh, 
lost his position as pastor. I don't know if he quit or he got fired, but he, uh, he wasn't preaching in the Baptist church anymore, and he was working around some people that were JWs. And so the JWs began to lure him into their fold. It wasn't long. He was, he was swallowing that hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> Falling for anything that comes along. Every wind of doctrine. That's what happens when we don't listen to the Word of God and apply it in our lives. And then the book of Hebrews talks about rest. They didn't, they didn't really embrace that rest that Jesus offered them. See, they're, they're in turmoil because they're being afflicted and persecuted by the temple worshipers. But the writer of Hebrews tells all through the book of uh, Hebrews, he says, Jesus has a rest to offer you. There is a peace that passeth all understanding when we latch on to him and move forward to him instead of getting stuck where we are. The satisfaction factor. Temple priests was offering them a mirage of the things to come. You see, the, the old temple worship, the ceremonies, the sacrifices, all were a shadow of Jesus Christ himself. Well, those shadows were fine when they didn't have Jesus, but now Jesus has come, and they're turning back from the substance to the shadow. It would be like me offering somebody a $100 bill and hold a mirror up to it, and they look at the mirror and say, you know, that one looks better over there. I think I'll take that one. And they take the mirror instead of the $100 bill. That'd be crazy, wouldn't it? Well, that's what they were doing in this temple worship. They were going back to the shadows, to the mirage, to the image of the true Jesus Christ. And they refused to mature. Hebrews 6.6 6 says, If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified themselves, the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. See, that's what they were doing. They knew Jesus had been crucified for their sins. They had accepted him. And fully knowing all that, they said, yeah, but we're going to go back to the shadows. What were they doing? They were crucifying the Son of God afresh. Because they're joining in with the ones who crucified him. The Jews. And he says in Hebrews 6.6, 6, if we shall fall away to renew them, Again, under repentance. What is he talking about? If it's not falling short of salvation or if it's not losing your salvation, what is he talking about? He's saying, look, in a nutshell, he's saying that as a Christian, when you move forward, you receive Christ as Savior. You're really saved. But if you refuse to mature, you refuse to go on, you refuse to advance in the cause of Christ, You've gone as far as you're going to go and your life will never advance any further till the day you die. What is the picture? And he talks about this picture in Hebrews about the wanderings of the Israelites. Remember, we preached about this just a couple of weeks ago. The Israelites came up out of Egypt when they were freed by Moses and the Lord used Moses to free them. They came up. They went into the wilderness area and got their Ten Commandments at Sinai and then they got up to Kadesh Barnea and, and God tells them, go on in. They send out ten spy, or 12 spies. And ten of them come back and give a false report. Two give a good report. The Hebrews say, no, we're going to believe those ten. They say, we can't take them. We can't win. We can't inherit that promise. God's already told them, you can inherit the promised land. I'm going to be with you and I'm going to fight for you. They said, no, we can't go. They refused to go on. Now get this, don't miss it because here's the gist of the whole message. They came to the very edge of the promised land, the blessed Christian life of moving forward in maturity. They said, no, we're not going to go in. And then what happened? Well, because they chose not to go in, they wandered for 40 years, and what happened to all of them except two people out of all those millions of Jews? Their carcasses fell in the wilderness. 
Why? Because they refused to go on. And they did not inherit that rest, that promised land. They spent their days wandering, wandering, wandering. And there are times when Christians can refuse to go on for the Lord. And God says, well, that was the line. You crossed it. Now you're never going to get any further. No repentance. Not for salvation, but for doing anything for the Lord, maturing. It says in Hebrews 3.17, But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom, to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest? But to them that believe not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Here's the truth of that. They said, we're not going in. And God said, okay, because of your unbelief, you're stuck. They couldn't enter in. What do you mean they couldn't? Well, they later decided they were going to go in. You remember that? <laughs> they said, well, they got rebuked a little bit. And they said, you know, Lord, we'll go on in. He said, no, you're not going. They said, yeah, we're going to go anyway. He said, no, you're not. <laughs> I wanted you to go, but you're not going now. Numbers 14, 42 tells us the story. He said when they, when they had balked and wouldn't go in, then they said, okay, we'll go. He said, no, too late. Numbers 14, 42, God says, go not up. For the Lord is not among you, that you be not smitten before your enemies. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and ye shall fall by the sword, because ye are turned away from the Lord. Therefore the Lord will not be with you. Verse 44, But they presumed to go up unto the hill top. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp, then the Amalekites came down, the Canaanites which dwelt on the hill and smote them and discomfited them even unto Hormah. They said, well, we'll we changed our mind. We'll go on up. The Lord said, nope, you're not going. <laughs> you're going to wander in this wilderness until you drop dead. And that they did. You see, when we refuse to be mature in the Lord, we refuse to go on. We refuse. There's something that's just stuck in our craw. We get mad at somebody in the church, get mad at the preacher or somebody, and we say, that's it, I'm not going to do any more. And then later on you say, well, okay, maybe I will. And the Lord may say to you, no, you're not. You're stuck in the wilderness. Stuck. There is a possibility for a believer to be apathetic for so long that God won't let him go on any further after a certain point. Their stagnation didn't simply cause them to stall there, but it dragged them down. Dr. A.W. Tozer used this to remind us. He said, every man must choose his world. True believers have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world or the age to come. And when we've tasted of the good word, the power of the Holy Spirit, in the age to come, realizing that God's going to give us rewards for being faithful and diligent to Him. This ought to cause us, listen Christian, this ought to cause us to be able to more firmly say no to sin. I won't give in. I won't do that. I won't commit fornication. I won't commit adultery. I won't do the drugs. I won't drink the booze. There's some things I'm just not going to do because we've tasted of the, the good word of God and we've tasted of the Holy Spirit. We've participated in His power and so we refuse to do those things to go back. And lastly there's a solicitation factor. Paul encourages them to make some real progress. He says in the last few verses that we read in verse number 6 <clears throat> he says in verse number 9 he says but beloved we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward His name, that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. 
Paul is trying to tell them, look, I know you've had it hard, and I know there's some that's turned back, and they may not recover, but he said, I've got better hopes for you. <laughs> he said, I've seen some things out of you that I believe are going to keep you moving forward. And this is the, the gem, the treasure, the diamond of it all, is that God doesn't want to give up on any of us. He wants us to keep moving forward. And he says, I, I've got hope for you. As long as you haven't got stuck and unmovable, I've got hope for you. There is an appraisal of hope that they have not gone too far. He's confident that they possess qualities of real Christianity. He assures them that God has not abandoned them because they're having some oppression and some persecution. They're saying, God's not, God's not forgotten what you've done. God knows the good things you've done. God knows your work of love and your ministry to the saints. And he exhorts them to faithfulness to the very end. He exhorts them to keep working for God. Warren Wearsby made this quote once. He said, I once asked a pastor friend, do you have a deaf ministry in your church? He replied, there are times when I think the whole church needs deaf ministry. They just don't seem to hear me. <laughs> I wonder if every preacher has thought that sometime or other because a preacher preaches hard out, preach against some sin, and then somebody go right out and do the very thing he preached against. Preacher will say, you know, we really ought to be witnessing to people, trying to get people saved and bring them in. And boy, it does my heart good, don't you, to see somebody get baptized like this morning when uh, Elizabeth got baptized. She got saved last week. She wasn't ashamed of it. She was glad to be saved. Her husband got saved a few weeks ago, and he got baptized. Um, there are people out there that are willing to listen. You may feel like the whole world is against you. Preacher says, why don't we get some people saved? Why don't we invite some people to come to church? And he wonders, I wonder if anybody really invited anybody to come to church. <laughs> I've had, over the years, there's been times when I've said, okay, next Sunday is every, everyone bring one next Sunday. Everybody go out and find one person that you can bring to church on Sunday. And nobody came. <laughs> and I'm wondering, I wonder if anybody really invited anybody. Or are they dull of hearing? We want to advance in the cause of Christ. When the Lord speaks to you, don't hesitate to act immediately. Because once you get stuck, there is a place, there is a time, I don't know where it is, that God just pulls back and says, okay, I'm finished. I did all I intended to do for you and you didn't respond, so I'm just going to turn elsewhere. Don't let that happen to you. I don't want it to happen to me. Martyred missionary Jim Elliott said it best. He said, he is no fool to give that, give what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. One of these days, we'll be in heaven with the Lord. And I wonder how many of us will say, I wish I'd have done more. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you'd bless us as a church. Lord, we've got some awfully good people. We've got some folks who do listen, folks who have learned, people who are going on and moving further. And Lord, I thank you for them. I pray that you'd cause every one of us to be hungry in our heart for the Word of God. Help us to be thirsty for the Spirit of God. Help us to want to see you work in our midst. Help us, Lord, to move forward and not get stuck where we are. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And if you'd stand as she plays...